Pastor. Welcome back. Certainly glad you could join us today because it's a fantastic day here and I hope it is wherever you're at. The 30-year-old has been painting in his own blood for the last 10 years and is showcasing his life work in a new exhibition. I had always liked collecting rare books and paintings with the extra money I made trading stock options on the side. My small two-bedroom apartment house was cluttered with them. I had bookshelves filled with original signed copies of works by Stephen King, Philip K. Dick, and Hunter S. Thompson that I had saved for years. I also tried finding ascending painters in the local art scene and buy up some of their works for the very low prices before they got discovered. Sometimes it worked out and sometimes it didn't. But as a whole, I had made far more money than I had lost over the decades. All of the works I liked most though, I refused to sell at any price. And these included the paintings of H.G. Bideker. After his mysterious death a few years ago, they had gotten the same kind of reputation as paintings done by serial killers like John Wayne Gacy that were sold openly, sometimes for tens of thousands of dollars on the internet. And like Gacy's strange portraits of Snow White or the Seven Dwarves or Grinning Clowns, Bideker's paintings all had a sinister and otherworldly pull. I had kept them locked up in a storage unit, but when the storage company told me that they would be doubling the rates, I decided to close the unit and take everything in it back to my house. I set up the macabre paintings around my room and the hallways, remembering the strange conversation I had with the artist just days before his ultimately death. People like to say that life is art, and meaningless platitudes like that. He said as he stood in front of a painting of a victim of murder, made to look like Shiva dancing the Tandeva. The black, eyeless sockets of the victim stared straight out at the viewer. His mouth was open, showing a spiraling galaxy of shining stars hidden within. Four emaciated pale arms jutted out from the sides of the starving body bent in the same posture as Shiva's eternal cosmic dance. The arms showed signs of torture, patches of burnt and melted flesh eaten into the body like a cancer. One mutilated leg was lifted into the air in a half-kicking motion. Deep gashes were sliced into its skin and muscle, revealing the white bone gleaming underneath. The emaciated dancer stood on a mountain of hundreds of skulls, many of them with fragments of hair and pieces of gore still clinging to the bone. Feeling slightly sickened, I turned away, chugging the entire bottle of apple juice I held in a few long swallows. But you want to know what I think? I think death is the true art. He continued, his gray eyes flashing over me. They looked flat and lifeless, as if all the hope had long ago been sucked out of this young artist. His face was narrow and serious with high cheekbones, and close-cropped black hair. So, what inspired you to paint this piece, for example? I said, glancing at the macabre murder victim piece. It had a small white placard. I recognized immediately that the placard showed me the name of the piece, the artist, the year it was created, and the materials used to create the piece. But it had to be a joke. All around us, people chattered softly as they sipped wine and sodas, moving slowly around the hall. The entire exhibit showed dozens of H.G. Bideker paintings, all of them extremely disturbing. I saw a painting of mass graves under a cold, black sky, with rings like those of Saturn, extending far out into the void. Next to it stood out one of a monk burning himself alive while sitting in complete peace. This piece was inspired from a dream I had, or maybe I should call it a nightmare. Do you know what the Tandava is? H.G. Bittaker asked me, his grey eyes flashing with excitement for the first time that night. I shook my head, but I leaned close, interested. The Hindus believe that we exist in an eternal multiverse where countless universes are constantly being created and destroyed. His maintenance is really just the ultimate reality from which all universes constantly spring. They say that the individual creator God for each universe arises out of Vishnu's navel. The creator is only a finite god with limited power. A being who they call Brahma. Brahma eventually ages and dies just like the universe itself. For you see, Brahma, the creator, is by far the weakest of the three. 
The eternal presence of the multiverse and the omnipresent power of death and destruction are much more powerful. When a universe has grown ancient, when it has started to turn gray and fade towards death, one far more powerful than the creator appears, Sheva, the destroyer. At that point, he begins his final dance for that universe, the Tandava, it is called. After Sheva starts to dance the Tandava, it cannot be stopped until everything in the universe is destroyed. He dances faster and faster until all the remaining matter and energy is annihilated, released back into the consciousness. He does this not out of hatred or spite, you understand, but out of love for all beings. In the destruction of the universe, enlightenment shines through and pure consciousness release can be used to start the process of creation again. So, you asked about what inspired this particular piece. Well, in one reoccurring nightmare I had, I saw this man, this pale victim of some death camp, I guess. His eyes had been cut out. His still body lay on top of a mass grave of rotting bodies with maggots writhing in his skin and hair. He showed clear signs of torture before the merciful release of death took him away. The many arms of the hundreds of other victims lying beneath him started to slither up like snakes, as if the dead were slowly coming back to life. It was like they were trying to reach upwards, trying to reach towards freedom from the rotting pit of horrors they found themselves in. The man on top, the one you see in this painting here, lifted his head and looked straight at me. His blue lips twitched and he abruptly inhaled again, but it sounded like his throat was filled with blood and dirt. Finally, he opened his mouth and with a gurgling well that seemed to come straight from hell itself, he spoke. I thought they was growing old and sick here. The dance will begin again soon. And then, the sky went black, and a burning cold descended on the world. A freezing wind blew. I looked into the sky and felt something dreadful and powerful hidden within those swirling currents of darkness. Through the black mist, I could see the barest silhouette of something massive, something whose whole body stretched across the sky, and I saw it dancing. After the art show, I had gone home and thought deeply about the words the tortured artist had said. His gray, lifeless eyes kept flashing through my mind. That night, I drank myself into a blackout until the merciful release of sleep took away the cycle of thoughts that seemed to repeat in my mind like a skipping record. It was three days later, after I had gone home from work late, that I saw the news. Breaking news suddenly flashed across the screen as a TV reporter stood in front of the expensive apartment building under a dark cloudless sky. It was a ritzy, expensive part of town near the art gallery. Police cars filled the street behind her as she smoothed the long lock of hair behind her ear. She blinked fast at the camera, seeming to finally realize she was live. I'm here with Channel 5 News in front of the Angel Trace apartment building where police are investigating multiple bodies found inside one of the residences. We have heard reports from police that the body of the locally renowned artist H.G. Bittaker was also recovered at the crime scene. Police refused to say what connection, if any, Mr. Bittaker may have had with. I rose from my chair, frantically shutting off the TV. The strange conversation I had with the artist a few days ago flashed through my mind over and over, but now the conversation seemed more sinister. Later that night, I went over to the computer and started doing some research. On various internet forums, I found strange things floating around. Those investigating the case said the victims were found chained inside H.G. Bittaker's apartment and that the police believed he had died from suicide. A lot of this was still speculation and rumor, while much of it was unconfirmed at first within a couple of days. It would all be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. As I would find out over time, the bodies of eight women were laid around H.G. Bittaker in a shape like a lotus petal. They showed signs of extensive, prolonged torture before their inevitable deaths from strangulation, like the painting I had seen in the gallery. These victims had their eyes cut out from their sockets, and their arms and legs burned or doused in some corrosive acid and strange occult symbols had been carved into their chests and stomach of their mutilated bodies. They had suffered greatly before their merciful release of oblivion. In the center of the circle of death, the police had found the body of H.G. Bittaker himself, 
He had burned himself alive while sitting in the full lotus position. The neighbors had noticed the choking clouds of black smoke that reeked of searing meat and gasoline. They kicked the door down only to find a den of horrors waiting beyond. H.G. Bideker had still been alive at this point, they said, and he had shown no signs of pain at all as he just sat there burning. Fat sizzled off his body in drops as his skin blackened and cooked. The neighbors extinguished the fire before it could spread, but by then, H.G. Bideker was dead. Apparently, H.G. Bideker had his own personal library with countless leather-bound tones on the occult and practices of human sacrifice, books about the thuggies and ancient devotional practices on both Kali and Shiva were also found scattered all over the apartment. After hearing this, I did some research about the thuggies. A group of cultists in India who estimated to have murdered up to two million people and where the word thug came from. There were cultists who would waylay travelers on the road, strangling them or breaking their necks with special nooses or silk handkerchiefs. The thuggies were devoted followers of the goddess of death and destruction, Kali. They believed they were saving the world by murdering innocent travelers in cold blood. For they offered these victims to the goddess of Kali. They hoped their sacrifices would keep Kali satiated so that she would not descend and destroy the entire world in a dancing inferno of death and destruction. As I sat in front of the computer with a glass of apple juice in my hand, my head started to feel like it was spinning from all the strangeness of the case. It seemed like I had many breadcrumbs here that must connect in some way, but for the life of me, I could not figure out how. Before the night was over, however, I would understand everything. I glanced behind me at the painting I had bought from H.G. Bideker after the art show, the one showing the emaciated death camp victim dancing the cosmic tendava. The eyeless sockets of the pale face seemed to stare directly into my soul. I shuddered, turning away and back to my empty glass. I felt as if I were in some sort of nightmare as I descended the stairs. The wood groaned softly under my weight. My heart pounded as I moved forward. As I reached the bottom step, that diseased gurgling rang out nearby. I spun, seeing the naked, emaciated body, with the four arms standing at the window in the dark kitchen, staring blindly out into the world with its black sockets of eyes. The strange man turned to face me, his face split into a grin, revealing the brown, rotted teeth hidden behind it, and the maggot squirming in his putrefying tongue and gums. Who are you? What do you want? I whispered, terrified. The grin seemed to widen further, the decaying flesh splitting along the seams of his lips. Dark, cotted blood dripped down from the torn flaps of skin on his cheeks. Do you not recognize me, John? The thing spoke in a voice that writhed with sickness and death, but at the same time I recognized it. It was the voice of H.G. Bideker, the dead artist and serial killer. I mix my own blood in the blood of those who ones who gave their lives to me with their bitchings. Even strands of the heroin now dried between the layers of paint. Strands of their hair and mine. Our essences have mixed the killer and the killed, the strap and the weak, the perpetrator and the victim, and the deadly self shrines to it all. Now I have got- The pale man stepped towards me, his mutilated legs cracking as the stiff limbs twisted and jerked, as if fighting the effects of rigor mortis. I I'm dreaming, I said, backpedaling away as he advanced on me. This can't be real. You're dead. You burned yourself alive. It was all over the news, goddammit. With inhuman speed, the mutilated man oozed towards me, grabbing me by the head with his cold, dead hands. The skin felt loose, almost falling off the bone and the smell of rot and putrefaction emanated from the body in thick clouds. I've met a friend of death. He hissed through his blackened teeth as maggots dripped from his blue lips. You too will find peace in death. He lunged forward suddenly. I felt his sharp splinters of broken teeth sink into my neck. 
A scream ripped its way out of my throat and I thrashed and kicked. Through the haze of pain, I abruptly remembered the letter opener in my hand. I brought it up into the body of the naked, rotting corpse, slicing deeply across his stomach. The thin skin burst open with a waterfall of clotted blood running out like sludge, the brown intestines of the corpse inside spilling out with hundreds of larva-like pale worms that feasted on the dead flesh. The pale man gave me a hissing scream. Black blood burst from his mouth, covering my face in its sticky splatters. My hands grew slick as I... My hands grew slick as my blood mixed with the fetid fluids dripping from the animated corpse. He pulled away with a banshee wail. I collapsed to the floor, holding my spurting neck with both hands as I slowly crawled away. I heard a window shatter behind me. Looking back, I saw the kitchen empty. The pale man had apparently jumped through the front window, leaving pieces of his decaying flesh hanging from the jagged shards of glass. With the last of my strength, I slowly made my way toward the front door, feeling weak and sick, stumbling as blood poured from my neck. I made my way to the neighbor's house. I pounded on their door, collapsing on the mat as they opened it. When I got home from the hospital, I went upstairs to look at the painting. A deep sense of curiosity mixed with an overwhelming dread as I opened the door. I saw piles of skulls, the stars like fragments of opal, but the pale victim at the center of the painting was gone forever.